Commitment to Truth, the outreach ministry of Commitment Community Church, a place for all nations. To learn more about Commitment, please visit our website, www.commitmentchurch.org. Like us on Facebook and download our mobile app. Now, let's enjoy today's message. All right, good morning, everyone. All right, good morning. All right, you may be seated in Let's just pray and ask God to help us this morning as we conclude a a sermon series I've entitled for you, Try Again. And um, we've been learning in this series that by God's grace, he gives us the opportunity to try and 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 try again and again and again and again. And it is immeasurable the amount of opportunities God gives us to get it right. Amen. So listen, the, uh, the, re- the, the undercurrent current in it all, I just want to it just impose upon you today, is to know that, man, when you fall down, get back up. When you fall down, get back up. And when you fail, fail forward. When you fail, you fail forward. Let's pray. Father, please help us to get this into our hearts and our minds and our souls. Uh, because we need it, we need it, uh, God, more than we can even uh, think or imagine. So, God, as as we bow our heads before you, those who are here and those who are watching us on Commitment Online, God, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts in a, a tangible, clear, life-changing, transformational way that we may know that we have heard from you this morning. Please, God, come and do what you do best, I pray in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. We all said Amen. So now listen, again, the underlining privilege of grace is that he gives us the opportunity to to do life again for his glory and also for the good of others. So thus, to to live uh, by grace is to try again and again uh, till you get it right, you know, uh, is to become men and women who sin less and less and less and less and less and less. On this side of heaven, we will never be sinless. In other words, we will never be absent from sin because we're still encased in this flesh. This, the 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 mind games that go along, uh, you know, in our hearts and minds for for uh, you know for each one of us. The reality would be we will struggle with that on this side of heaven until we see him face to face. The temptations we will struggle with on this side of heaven until we see him face to face. But yet. Again, God gives us the opportunity to get it right more often than not. There'll be some things you'll find in your life that you'll say, man, that is one and done. I have no more problems with that. But then there were some things that would just seem to reappear and appear and appear over and over again, uh, similar to, to, as Paul mentioned, the thorn in your flesh. And remember, he even says in, in that particular passage in Corinthians, he says, he says that God sent you know, the tormentor to torment me. Okay, so yes, God will even allow certain things to your ha- in, in your life to happen to, to nudge you closer and closer to him so that you can ultimately surmise this, that my grace is sufficient, that in my weakness, he makes me strong. In my fallibility, in my insecurities, in my, uh, uh, my desire to, to sin, in my inability to get it right, his grace will always be sufficient for you. It will always be that part of the relationship with Christ that will push you and nudge you closer and closer to Christ. And that's why the definition I gave you of grace is this. It's, of course, God's unmerited favor, him giving you something you don't deserve, right? But he giving you uh, more than this is that he wants to, if you would, exert his holy influence upon you. He wants to impose his holiness upon you because at the end of the day, he says this, that you and I must be holy as what? He is holy. So that that standard would never, ever not be in existence, even in the midst of our struggle with certain things. The standard of holiness will always be there, thus enter Jesus Christ, right? Uh, So uh, the definition goes on to, to say this, he turned us towards an affection towards Christ to a point that we inevitably want to exercise this lifestyle of Christ. 
So he keep nudging us and imposing himself upon us and imposing himself upon us until we begin to develop this fond affection for Christ uh, to the point that we want to live as Christ. We want to live out our lives in a way that is exemplifying the person and the character of Jesus Christ. That being said, what I'd like to do uh, is finish the sermon series by, by answering this one question is this, and it is, what is it like to live grace? What is it like to live grace? If you can, go back to Ephesians chapter 2, which we've been in the book of Ephesians for the most part during the series, and I've kind of captured Ephesians as the, the letter of grace. It's the letter of grace because there's so many examples of, of God working it out with us, if you would, in our marriage, in our families, in our personal relationships with each other, and nudging us more and more and more, closer and closer uh, to become men and women who live, the char- live out the character of Jesus Christ. So how do we then uh, live this grace? How does this look like for us? There's about five points I would like to give you nestled within Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 3. So let's start with Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse number 8. And then our our first point we're going to find in verses 14 through 17. But let's begin with verse 8 for context sake. It says that, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we will walk in them. Then verse 11, it says, Therefore, remember that you, that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at the, the time, at that time, separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the what? Blood of Jesus Christ, we learned last week, right? And then it goes on to say in verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, and broke down the barrier, the dividing wall, by abolishing in the flesh the enmity, which is, is the law uh, of commandments, containing uh, the ordinances, so that in, in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. In verse 17, it says, And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, peace to those who are also near. So here's our first uh, way that we can live out grace is we got to become people who learn how to live as one. Living by grace is living as one. Living by grace is living by, as one. To live by grace is to live as one. Listen to what it says again. He himself is our peace, made two groups into one, broke down barriers of the dividing wall. The word peace means this, a state of national tranquility, peace between individuals. So if you can now grab a hold to that in in your heart and mind right now, and you survey the United States of America, all right, the United States of America is not at peace. The United States of America is, is, even though it is at peace, meaning that it's not at war, but within itself there's this civil war, if you would, that is going on to the point that there's no t- national tranquility and there's not peace in between individuals, especially race, culture, socioeconomic class. It's clear. It's, it's more evident than ever that we're not healed, we're not one. More than ever, it's clear that we're not one. But then you also have this dividing factor within the body of Christ. You have people who, who know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and yet they still can't get it. Listen, you, you have Sunday morning, 11 o'clock is still, for the most part, one of the most segregated hours in America. We can't even get that right. Not to mention denominationalism. Not to mention Issues that go on inside of the church. 
the same church. The same church at the same address. Listen, we must learn to become men and women who live as one within the body of Christ, throughout the body of Christ. We must learn, listen, learn to be men and women. If we want to really experience the grace of God, experiencing the grace of God is not always being at odds with people. You cannot say that you're walking in the matchless, blood-bought grace of God and you find yourself always arguing and fighting and in, in some riff with someone else in the church or outside the church. The grace of God simply says to you and I, uh, he gave me a chance, second chance, third chance, fourth chance, fifth chance, sixth chance. I need to learn how to give other people a chance. I must get to a point in my life that I say something like this to myself. This is what I must get to in a point in my life, is that if I have something between you and me that is dividing you and me, could it be me that's causing the division? Why is that important to grab a hold to? When you look at the relationship between God and man, God reconciled us back to himself, but man seems to always redivide himself from God. It's not God. It's us. So if a husband and wife is divided, if a mother and a daughter is divided, if a son and a father is divided, if a, if a pastor and the deacons and the elders, if if whites or blacks and pinks and purples are divided, could it be that I'm the problem? That I'm not being the agent of peace? That I'm not giving God an opportunity to exercise peace through me? This word one, you know what it means? One. <laughs> it means emphatically one. In other words, it's kind of saying there's no other option through the blood of Christ, through the finished work of Jesus Christ, but for us to become one. Listen, have you ever had people in your life that it seems like they're unavoidable? It's like you, you just can't get them out of your life. Well, chances are God wants to teach you how to live at peace with them, no matter what. You see, you can divorce your husband or wife, but you know what? At the end of the day, unavoidable. They will always be a part of you. Always be a part of you. Always be a part of you. So at the end of the day, a person has to come and calculate within their heart and mind and say, what must I do, as the scripture says in Romans 12, as far as it depends on me, I will live at peace with all men. Galatians 3, 26 to 28 says this, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. It says there's neither slave or free. You can say that the scriptures are saying their extremity, okay? In other words, white, black, or Jew, and Gentiles were synonymous with everyone who wasn't Jew. So what the scriptures are saying to you and I, there's no other dividing factor, okay? There's nothing else that should cause this separation or this rift between us because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, because of the grace of God. There's no rich, poor. There's no slave or free. Rich, poor. There's no boss and employee. Because ultimately, God is what? The boss. For you, it says, are all one in Christ Jesus. Then Philippians 1 verse 27 says this, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you are remain absent. I hear of you that you are standing firm, it says, in one spirit, with one mind. 
striving together for the faith of the gospel. You see, this is what is at risk, church, the gospel. You can stand your ground, and you can post stuff on Facebook, and you can post stuff in Twitter, and you can read stuff in Twitter. You can read stuff on Twitter. You can read stuff on Facebook that is dividing us like never before. You can sit there and imagine stuff that will cause division. But it clearly says to you and I that we must become men and women who are firm in one spirit. That at the end of the day, even if there's a disagreement, even if there's an assumption of you said this, feel this way towards me, I would, by, by, by the power of the Holy Spirit that works within me, do whatever it takes to maintain unity. Even if it means that I must be crucified. Even if it means that I must admit that I'm wrong and I'm not wrong. With one mind striving together, it says, for the faith of the gospel. It didn't say, listen, it didn't say, do this for your family. It says, it didn't say, do it for your husband or your wife or your children or your parents. It says, for the gospel's sake. You know why it says, for the gospel's sake? Because if you aim at the gospel, God will take care of your husband, your wife, your children, your parents, and everybody and everything you love. You aim at your parents and people you love, you miss the gospel, you're on your own. You're on your own. Grace brings peace. Therefore, reconciliation and unifying is so possible. It is so possible. It is not something that is unimaginable. It is something that is possible in the most horrific, frustrating, disappointing uh, experiences that you will ever have. Oneness is possible through and in uh, the grace of God. Then you skip down to verse number 18. It says, For through him... We both have our access, it says, in one spirit to whom? The Father. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. You hear that? You're of God's household. God's household. Not your household. God's household, it says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets it's, and, and, and Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together and growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you, are, you also are being built up together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So think about that. If I spend all of my time trying to build my own house, build and construct everything that's important to me, I can build a structure that God can't dwell in. And that's why you see marriages fall apart. That's why you see families fall apart. That's why you see businesses fall apart. Is that I'm building this structure, I'm building this infrastructure, I'm building this 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 vision, if you would, of my own, and he can't dwell in it. But if we realize that this living one as one, the grace of God is living as one, this oneness, you know what it begins to translate into? Living as the family of God. Living as the family of God. Living as the family of God says that um, we have access to each other. There's one father, one household. It's never you against me. It's never my household against your your household. It's never my household is more important than your household. 
It's never that. The grace of God through the finished work of Jesus Christ touches every household simultaneously. So you find this, right? So if you go back to Galatians chapter 3, verses 20 through 29, remember we read part of that? It says, for all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You know what you find in there as well? Women's lip. What he's saying is women are just as important as men. You don't need to fight for that, ladies. You don't need to fight to, to be seen and heard. Just be a part of the household of God. He takes care of you. You don't need to fight to defend yourself. He's your defender. So when you continue to read in verse 29, it says, And if you belong to Christ, man, woman, and child, does your marriage belong to Christ? Do your family belong to Christ? Does your business belong to Christ? Right? Listen to what it says. Then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. Guess what? We're all family. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we have the same father with the same family living in the same household with no walls. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10 says this, So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Listen to what it says. To all people. All people includes, no matter race, culture, social, economic class, all people also includes your family, your husband, your wife, your children. It includes everyone. It's all encompassing, right? All people. Listen to what it says, though. And especially to those who are the household of faith. One thing I see so many times in the body of Christ is this. You have people come to know Christ. They start growing in Christ because they're void and they're needy. Okay? Maybe something has happened in their lives, then they attach then once life begins to circulate within their bones and their family and in their life, then they detach. Because there's a deception that, okay, I'm good now. I'm good now. Well, the deception is you're not good. You're just better than you were. Because no one on this side of heaven is good. Right? Because we've been learning, right? Our righteousness is but like what? Filthy rags. So whatever's good is not really relatively good. So we start feeling good because we feel better than we were. Then we start detaching from what has breathed life into us. And what continues to infuse life into us, then we are deceived, then we detach thinking that I can continue to now just live on my own, do things on my own, apart from the family of God. When you get home, do an experiment. Don't tell anyone I told you this. But go home, get a hammer, and hit your thumb. And see how much you need your thumb. See how much your thumb has impacted your brain your eyes, right? Your nose, because you probably start, start, you would start probably crying, and your nose starts drooling, right? You know, so you hear what I'm saying? I'm being funny, but serious. That we many times we think, okay, I'm attached to the body now. I can detach from the body, and a, the body's not affected by me detaching from it, and I'm not affected by me detaching from the body. It's a lie. We will always need, always need each other because we're family. Now, the beautiful of the family, of, beautiful, beautiful thing about the family of God is when you have family, biological family, who are also part of the family of God, it's like a super duper duper blessing. 
But there's something supernatural that God imparts within us because we are a part of the family of God. So to live grace, you must learn how to live as one. You got to get over your issues with people. If you always find yourself with issues with people, could it be that you are the common denominator? And once you work through that, then it's this wonderful thing begins to happen with those people who are now uh, with you who have the same father, part of the same heritage, part of the same body. Then there's this family dynamic that begins to happen. Sometimes that is closer than your, even your own biological family who may not understand it. Grace influences us to live under the father and in his household. Grace will not let you go until you get it. And what you'll find is that even in a household, just like you, if you hit a, a rough patch, you call family, right? Hey, mom, can you loan me? <laughs> mom, can I come at home? You know, what you'll find, even in the body of Christ, from a tangible sense, are resources. And so many times as a pastor, I see people go without because they're not connected. They go without because they have no relationship with no one who possibly could hire them, who possibly can say, hey, what you're going through right now, there's light at the end of the proverbial tunnel, and it's not a train coming at you. But there has to be the acceptance of I need this person in my life. I always tell people, listen, I wouldn't, you know why I pitch church and church community? It's because I need it too. And being away from our family in California for 30 plus years, you know the only family we had was the family of God. I can't... One day, Lisa and I were watching a video of our oldest Joshua Day party. And we're singing, happy birthday, too. And it was just echoing and hollow and because it was only the three of us in the house. No family at all. But what we begin to realize is that we did have family. And there were people, listen, that we could trust with our children. That we could possibly trust with our children more than our biological family. Can I let you into our life a little bit more? When our children were younger, we, Lisa and I, made an agreement that if something ever happens to us and we talk to the couple who we're still close with today that if something will happen to us our children would go to them and they weren't our family and they were white <laughs> it was like a double whammy We're still, still close friends today, over 30 years of relationship and friendship in Christ. But we felt and prayed and said, you know what? At the end of the day, we believe that this couple will be able to continue to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Because they were family. Not through words, but through pain and working through stuff and developing trust that I can say, you know what? I can leave my daughters with this guy who's not, my, who's not me. You gotta work through it, church. You gotta work through it, become one, accept your family heritage. After we accept our family heritage, this is what begins to happen, I believe. Chapter three, verse one and two starts us off, it says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of, the, of God's grace, 
which was given to me for you. Now, fast forward because I want just for, to expedite some things. Verse 14 through 16, it says this. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in the inner man. Try to cut your hand off and see how strong your hand would be without your body. Try to cut your hand off and see how strong your body would be without your hand. You're one. You become family. Family allows you to start living in the power of God. Yes, we know family rubs us wrong, and you want to disown every now and then a family member. But at the end of the day, man, family does something to you that keeps you going, right? The same thing with the spiritual family. We cannot live without each other. You can't. You can't. And it will be inevitable. Listen, the grace of God will push you into a situation that you'll realize that, you know what? I need my church family to allow me and to enable me and to empower me to live and walk in power. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another man's countenance. Bad company corrupts what? Good morals. So you could say conversely, good company does what? Improve morals. Why wouldn't I want to be around the family of God? Because the family of God is going to help me live in the power of God. You'll be strengthened. The word strengthen means to grow strong. Some of you today are just hanging on by the skin of your chinny chin chin. You know, just working through and just hanging on by a thread. And do some research in, your, in, in who is surrounding you. Or is there someone even surrounding you at all? Living in power helps you grow stronger. The word power means intrinsic power, either physical or moral power. That's what the body of Christ. Listen, there's times you just got to lean on someone. If you didn't know, listen, the, we, are, we are so identified in the scripture with sheep. Did you realize uh, pound for pound, the sheep are the not as smart people, uh, our animals creation on the face of the planet. And you know what the shepherd had to do if the sheep was stray? If the, street, the sheep would continue to stray, continue to stray, continue to stray, he'll go get the one, for, leave the 99 and get the one. He'll bring them back to the 99. But you know what he had to do? Break his leg. He says, you're not going to run off again. I want to teach you dependency on each other. And God will do that. He will allow our, our legs to be broken to cause us to have dependence on each other. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6 through 10 says this. He describes living in power this way. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all godliness and righteousness and truth. And here's the beauty. This is so God. Look, look at verse 10. Short but sweet. Trying, trying, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. God covers everything. He tells you, you got to be consistent in this goodness, in this righteousness and truth. But you got to at least try. Try. 
got to try to walk in power. Trying to learn simply means that you're just going through a process of affirming what is learned as it being the right thing. Yeah, some of us will maybe hop on and learn a little quicker than others. But man, you still got to try to learn. Got to try to learn what is pleasing to God, not what's pleasing to your husband and your children and your parents and your employer. And we will try our best. We will study people in our lives. We will study, look at their facial expressions, see what upsets them, see what makes them happy. And we will just dissect, dissect, and we will just alter our entire lives to please someone and never please them. trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Living in grace is not weakness, but listen, it's living in power through the Holy Spirit. It's a powerful life in and through Christ. It's not weakness at all. Living in power begins to then translate into this in verse 17, verses 17 through 19, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts Through faith and that being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Searching for the love of God? Well, become one with people you have issues with. Learn to accept your place in the household of God, your family. And we just can't discard each other like that anymore. We can't go on and live apart from each other anymore. We can't do that anymore. We cannot be people who are isolated and and just think that you don't need people over your house that are Christians and part of your church and that that's imposing on you. And, oh, engage groups? Oh, what does that mean? Someone's over my house? Oh, well, I got to remodel my house. I got to change. I got to move to this new house so I get more. No. Just be family. Well, yeah, I got to cook something special because the pastor's coming over. Well, I got to cook something special because the church people are coming. I got to hide my DVD tapes. And <laughs> right? And make all these alterations because the Christian company is coming over. <laughs> right? Well, you know, you know I, I can't be smoking, so you better shh. <laughs> there he smell the smoke, you know. <laughs> can you can you smell the smoke on me? <laughs> We're just so silly. And then we find out, you know, God, this is what God would do to you. He'll just back you up in a corner. You'll be riding down the road and you turn to the right, you have a cigarette in your mouth, and it's the person from church. And he'll just set you up that way. It's like, come on now. <laughs> right? He'll just still do it to you all the time. You know? <laughs> Versus just being real, you know? You know, being family. Family helps you then to overcome these things because you are family. And you don't just you don't just kick family to the curb like that. Which translates into the very thing that sent Jesus to the cross, kept them on the cross, the very thing that allows us to fulfill the entire law and the words of the prophet, and that is becoming men and women who are living in love. That's the end game. 
How do I live in love? That I'm not living because it's religious. I'm not living because the pastor told me to do it. I'm not living because, you know, I don't want to get caught doing wrong, you know, and all these little Christian religious garbage. I'm living because of love. It says you could be rooted. The word rooted means cause a person or thing to be thoroughly grounded. The word grounded means to lay a foundation or to make stable. If you have instability in your life, chances are you got a love issue. You got a love issue. How do I know this? We all fall short, right? My wife doesn't love me. Lisa doesn't love me like I think I do. Then I act like the fourth child. I act unstable. Walk around pouting. <laughs> right? Let's be real. It happens to all of us. We become, we become unstable until I realize my love is in him, through him, for him, because of him. And then you know what? She can do, say whatever she wants to say, but I remain what? Stable. Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 2 says this. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. It says, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for you in offering a sacrifice to God, a fragrant aroma. Man, when people come around us, they, they just, just smell Jesus. Living in love leads to our final point. Verse 20 and 21, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to what? The power that works within us. Underscore, underscore the context. Many people recite that Bible, that Bible verse. My God is able to do what? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all we ask or think. But How? Through the power that's what? In you. God doesn't work, even though he could, isolated from you. Even though he could today still rain manna from heaven. Even though he could, you know, raise the dead. But, but you know what he chooses many times to do? Work through you and you and you and me and us. Living in love turns into the final point is this. Living to glorify him. Whatever I do, as for his glory, he says, to him be the glory, guess where? In the church, in whom? In Christ Jesus, and guess where? To all generations. So I don't want my children to grow up to be like me. I want my children to grow up to be like him. I don't want my children to grow up and, and say, okay, I got to do this because daddy wants me to do this or that. Or No, no, no. At the end of the day, you go do whatever God has created you to do so that you can be sure to bring him glory, not me. That should be our ultimate goal as parents. You don't go to school because I told you to go to school. You don't get a degree because I told you to get a degree. You don't be successful because I want you to be successful, even though they will somehow impose that on us. That's just the way we are as children. We all do that. But at the end of the day, we must emphasize and overemphasize and live out that at the end of the day, you become whom God has called you to be, created to be, so that you can be sure not to glorify mom or dad, but to make him happy. But it begins with mom and dad. It begins with those who of us who are influencers to recognize that it is our responsibility to bring him glory in everything we do. The word glory, you know, what I mean? you know what it means? It means to recognize, or if you could say it this way, it is to recognize a thing belonging to God. 
that my life and everything I do doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. My children, my children's children, my children's children, throughout all generations until Jesus comes back, they don't belong to me. I recognize they belong to him. When someone gives you praise and honor and adoration, they give you trophies and plaques and, and so forth, you, we, must always immediately recognize it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. You get pay increases and bonuses and, and, and life begins to hum on all cylinders. No, no. Don't ever think that it belongs to you. belongs to him. That new house you buy, that upgrade house, that fancy car that you peek out the window to look at when it's shining bright and the tires are glowing in the dark, you know? At the end of the day, our responsibility is to be men and women and understand, no, that there's nothing I can take for my possession. Everything I recognize belongs to him. And when we recognize that, we will always be sure that everything that we do, say, or think is bringing him glory. Last verse I want to read to you is this, to summarize this. Verses 15 through 20, uh, first, uh, first chapter in Colossians. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him, so that, verse 17, skip to that, it says, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. We were created, we breathe, we live, everything around us was created, it lives to ultimately, climactically be so that Christ can have first place in everything. Everything. And everything in the Greek means everything. Everything. He wants to be first chair in. Living as one, helps us live as a family. Live as a, living as a family help us to live in power. Living in power helps us to live in love. Living in love, we can be sure that we will be uh, uh, living to glorify him. There's one word in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, or at the end of 21, I want to end with. Amen. You, you see, in, in the in old churches in the South a lot, in the Southern Baptist churches, right, you hear a lot of what? Amen, Patrick. Right? <laughs> you know, the pastor says, boo, amen. <laughs> Choo, amen. <laughs> It is, amen, amen. It's like, amen, 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 amen. And, and you, you hear one person say, amen, 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 like a hundred times before the church service is over. <laughs> amen. <laughs> but do they really know what they're saying? Historically, in the temple, and whenever someone was teaching a lesson, they'll, communic they'll communicate a truth. The people will respond, amen. Amen didn't mean that you're preaching good, preacher. Amen says, I agree, and so let it be done in me. I say to you today, that God, through his grace, is giving us the opportunity to try and try again. But if you want to be a man or a woman, young or old, who lives grace, you have to say, amen, let it be done in me. I will live in love.
a man, I will be a man, I'll be a woman, I'll be a child who live to glorify him. I will live as one. I will live as a family of God. I will live in the power of God. You have to be a man, woman, or child that agrees. You got to say amen. Not amen because it sounds good, but amen because it's right. And I agree that it should start taking place in my heart, my life, for generations to come. Let's pray. As the uh, worship team comes forward, could you just agree with God today? You know, is he challenging you to say amen to becoming one, say amen to the family of God? Is he speaking to you to say amen to start living in power? Is he saying to you that you must begin to be a man or woman or child to say amen to living in love and living to glorify him you could just bow your heads and close your eyes and and whatever one whatever which whatever one applies to you if all of them apply to you are you willing to say amen to them And as uh, those can come up front to be up front for prayer, um, listen, the altar's open. If you want someone to pray for you, these brothers and sisters will be up front to pray with you. But let God just deal with your heart so you can walk out today and say, Amen. Thank you for listening to Commitment to Truth, the outreach ministry of Commitment Community Church. If you would like to learn more about Jesus Christ, please visit our website, www.commitmentchurch.org forward slash start. This website will walk you through having a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Please let us know if you made a decision to follow Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, or if you would like to support God's word through this ministry, please visit our website at www.commitmentchurch.org. Lastly, if you or your family are in the South Jersey or Philly metro area, please visit us at Commitment Community Church.